Good evening and welcome to Breaking the Consensus, Family and Life's interview with opinion formers, people that matter but are not going to be reported in the mainstream media. Tonight we're incredibly lucky. We have Professor Gerard Casey who has very politely volunteered with us, well he has been volunteered in fairness, <laughs> to do an interview. Professor Casey is or was the Professor of Philosophy in UCD. He's an internationally renowned author and he is also known as a political activist on the conservative and Christian side in Ireland. Professor Casey, you're a Cork man and you end up as a philosopher. Yes, indeed. Why, why, why do you sound so surprised? <laughs> well, I'm from Kilkenny. Anything Cork people does surprises us. You're, um, you're from Kilkenny? Yes. If I'd known that, I wouldn't have come. There you are. See, <laughs> typical Cork man. Um, how did you end up in philosophy? How did I end up in philosophy? Hard, hard thinking. Uh, well, I, I was in secondary school in Cork at Presentation Brothers College. Yes. And I was bored because, <laughs> frankly, the kind of things they were talking about didn't interest me much. And then when I was about 16, I discovered philosophy uh, and I got all excited and I read like crazy. Can I ask you, how did you discover it? I mean, what did you fall upon? Oh, what book I, or? Uh, Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian. Right. <laughs> And that mm, made you consider philosophy and the, the process of thinking. It did that, and it also yeah. turned me into a non-Christian very quickly. Ah, so at this point, you're a 16-year-old boy. You, yeah. You've abandoned Catholicism. Yep. When it's all rubbish. I gave it all up. Under the influence of Bertrand. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Were you a big Russell fan at that stage? Uh, yeah. Yes, I was. Yeah. Yeah. When did Russell's aura fade and you return oh, to well, the Oh, well, I became quickly aware that with Bertrand Russell, you had to date his works. It was like Russell 1916 or Russell 1919. There was a vintage. The guy, the guy changed his mind so many times, it was hard to keep up with him. He had a big mind. He was, he, you know. He did have a big mind, and he was a wonderful writer, as yes. many of the English philosophers yeah. were. But yeah, so that's what started me off, and then I, I read all of the, sort of the classics by the time I was 20. I don't say that in any boastful way. In fact, it's, uh, it's more an admission of guilt because really you're not supposed to read philosophy quite that way. Mm. But uh, I did, and then I, when I was 20, I gave it all up because it was making me miserable, and I figured I could be miserable without actually having to work at it. That's true. Most people can. Uh, <laughs> I do a good job on it myself. But at 20, you must have been in college. I wasn't. No, no. When I got out of school, I swore I would never go through the gates of another educational establishment again. Don't you think there's some sort of strange irony in this? You seem to have gotten that <laughs> wrong somehow. You end yeah. up, you leave school, you've had no further education. What did you do? I played music and made a living for a number of years. I traveled. You were a professional musician. Well, yeah, that's probably stretching it a bit. But I, I, well, I you got paid to play music. I, yes, and probably paid to stop. But, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, You were the second Cork professor I have interviewed who earned a living playing music. Who was the other one? Professor Casey, Professor uh, Patricia Casey. Really? Paid her way through college playing country and western songs. I refer to her as my other wife. Oh, uh, there you yeah, are. Sorry, that's just a joke because my wife is actually called Patricia Casey. And, there, <laughs> and <laughs> Professor Patricia Casey, whom you all know, is not in any way related no, to you. No. Yeah. Although I did, I did sing in, the, in, a, in a choral group with her sister many years ago. So it's all Cork very people are just it's a mafia. all very incestuous. Yes. So, <laughs> what happens? You're earning a living, you're playing music, you're traveling. Well, I was working in the Netherlands and I had this wonderful job cleaning the inside of beer tanks. <laughs> okay. It's a it, this is where not, did it all go wrong? Where did it all go wrong? I don't know. So there I was working in this and the, it would cut a long story short because it's a very long story, but the short version is I found myself uh, alone for most of the day with no one to talk to and even when I did it had to be in Dutch and I didn't have a lot of Dutch right so I was effect it, it was almost as if I was on a desert island so really <laughs> there are no distractions you nothing to do but think so <laughs> I thought always leads to bad results it all lead to bad results so by the time I after a year of this I thought well there are only two things to do one is to get drunk and stay drunk okay I'm just joking but I mean as you know get distracted with things of the world whatever entertainment and so on or face up to the kind of questions that started me off in philosophy. Is there any meaning? Does it make any difference what you do with your life? And um, yeah, and I thought, well, I'll go for the second. Came back to Ireland, worked for a year. This is before we had free fees, so-called. And I went to university, and I never escaped from its gravitational attraction. What did you do in university? You did philosophy. I did philosophy. I did logic. I did English uh, and, and, archaeology. and archaeology. And archaeology. And you continued on. You end up with a doctorate. Yes. And now that leads you by a long route 
to becoming professor of philosophy in UCD? Yeah, I came back. So when I when I graduated from UCC, I I got a scholarship to the University of Notre Dame, in the news today, as we all know, for all the wrong reasons. Uh, not the university, but the cathedral, the cathedral. In, in Paris. And uh, so, yes, uh, and I got my degree there. And then I taught for three years at Catholic University in Washington. Okay. Uh, by this time, I'd become a Catholic. Again? <laughs> Again, yeah. A long, another long story we'll, and so on. And, uh, and then a job came up in UCD, a place I'd never been. I came back to the interview. They offered me the job. I was in two minds about taking it. I really liked it in America. Uh, I had, my wife and I had three children at that stage. And um, it was kind of touching on. My wife really wanted to come home. I wanted to stay. Okay. But I came home. You came home and... And I said I, I, and I spent you the next 30 years. The next 30 years here. I know that you, when people talk about that awful term of self-identifying, that you self-identify primarily as a Catholic. Yes. That's your first role. Yeah, absolutely. What do you mean by that? Uh, nothing very grand, and I'm not making yeah. any special claim to eminence. I'm just an ordinary uh, pew-sitting Catholic. I believe all the church beliefs and teaches. Uh, I try to live my life uh, in accordance with the dictates of the church. I fail like everybody else, so uh, I, I feel like the, uh, the publican or the tax collector at the back of the synagogue when he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner, because that's always true. I'm going to have that printed on my, when I, when I die and I have my funeral, one of the things that's going to be printed are two things. One, domine non sub dignus, Lord, I'm not worthy. I mean, the other one is, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Which would well behove any of us yep, to are. say. Yeah, when I address Catholics, by the way, I usually address them as hello sinners, because that's, <laughs> and I, w I once said as a joke uh, when I was being interviewed, uh, if somebody ever describes me as a devout Catholic, I would get extremely worried, because anyone who's described as a devout Catholic in the media is normally somebody who's actually on the way out. Well, yeah, it's a sign that if, if you're described as a devout Catholic, it's a sign that your, your days are rather limited. <laughs> anyway. This is, this has, in, uh, as, as Frank McGuinness might say, uh, become a cold country for yes. Catholics. Yeah, I'm, I, I must be a contrarian by nature. I think it must have something to do with being from Cork, because when, when Catholicism was the sort of norm, I was anti-Catholic. Right, so that put me on the wrong side, and now that that being Catholic is the wrong thing to be. I'm a Catholic again. You I can't, can't seem to manage get it right. fashionability, I can you? I can't get it right. <laughs> the last, I mean, one might have said that there was anti-Catholicism in Ireland, but in the last three to five years, mm. it has become open and obvious. Oh yes. Yeah. How did you feel the last referendum, the abortion referendum? How did you feel that was mm. run? Well, it's very hard for me to say. I mean, I've got to the stage in my life where I'm no longer really taking an active part. I, I, I made some contributions behind the scenes, some very small ones and some financial ones, as almost everybody did. I take no credit for that. That's the very well, least that we could do. I, I mean, say, if we ignore, ours, if you like, our side of it, the, the anti-abortion side, the government created a, a partnership mm. with elements of civil society mm. in this. Did you feel that? impinged on uh, the proper functioning of a democracy even. Well, no, I mean, we could get into that, but yeah. really, uh, you know, one of the things we need to do, because it's still been a very short time, comparatively speaking, we need to reflect and pray and think about what we need to do. Uh, but the first thing we, t we need to do, in the words of Corporal Jones from Dad's Army, is don't panic. Don't panic. <laughs> don't panic. Uh, we, if you think about it, in 1983, when the referendum was passed, People on the other side, at that stage, were in the position we're in now. It was a two to one. Yes, yeah. almost the, the exactly the same yeah. thing. And they, it took them 35 years to they get it. And, to and they spent the 35 years. And they spent years. the 35 years working yeah. at it. We need to take a lesson from them in what they did, in their networking, in their contacts, in their infiltration of the institutions, uh, both political, social, non-governmental, uh, in their policy work, in their publicity, all of the things that they did, we need to do. But the one thing that they did, which uh, and I think, and again, this, uh, this is going to sound like I'm blaming people. And it's no, no, no. No, you but also going to make it sound as if yeah. I, so I somehow know better than yeah. everybody else. I don't. Uh, I thought we would lose that referendum, and I was right, but I didn't think we would lose it by the amount that we did. That was really shocking to I me. I think any of us that were involved in fighting it, believed there was a possibility we could lose. I got it wrong. Yeah. I thought on the day we had it won when mm. the poll numbers kept climbing. Yeah. Why, how did we lose that culture yeah. in that uh, way? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't any single event. 
It wasn't yes. any single thing. It was a it was a process. I think that I think if you like, we were losing the culture already, even back in 1983. So we weren't on and up. In a sense, 1983 happens because the there was a sense mm. that there was a danger. There hadn't been really a danger That's right. up to then. Even yeah. when the Americans had Roe versus Wade. 1973, we weren't in danger. No, but we, we saw from the American experience what would happen, and that's why people pushed for the referendum. But that was done because there was an awareness already that, in a sense, the culture was changing. And what's happened since 1983 is that the culture has continued changing. And we, if, we look at, if you look at the way we presented our case and so on, in terms of the arguments, in terms of what we're dealing with, I think we won all the arguments hands down. In other words, what the argument the that this is yeah. a child, oh, this is a, this child is a human and, being, and a human being, and deserves rights and so on. What we didn't win were was the feeling argument. Uh, what you described as the pathos. The pathos, yeah. In other words, we were we, and also we didn't we didn't win the ethos argument, which is uh, we were presented as. I'm not saying that this is what we are, but we were presented as being hard-hearted. Yes. Dogmatic. Yes. Uncaring. Yes. Insensitive. Yes. Right. Uh, again, <laughs> and whereas the other side presented themselves as the caring and feeling ones, which is quite bizarre when you think about it. Right? They because want to kill babies, uh, but they're the caring <laughs> ones. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. And also the the hard case argument, which of course, in terms of the amount of abortions that take place uh, in areas where they've had it much longer is actually a tiny percentage. I, I think it's below, it's sort of be wiggles depending on how, how yeah, you define it's it, tiny. Uh, up to 2%, but no more. If, if, yeah. if, it's if that, it gets that. If it's that. Yeah. So th th all of those hard cases, the ones that appeal to the emotions, the one where people would say, uh, oh my gosh, if my daughter were in that situation, and so on, and they, and, and I'm, I'm not making fun, I'm not making light of any of this, but no, the, 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 these were the kinds of things, the places they put people in, and uh, so that combined, the, the, the pathos argument, in other words, the hard-hearted, uncaring way in which people in favor of life were portrayed, together with the, the feeling argument on the other side, uh, really outbalanced the yeah. logical arguments that we presented. Isn't some of that the loss of the culture? The fact that it didn't matter how good we were, the mainstream media was completely overrun with people who were utterly opposed to what we were saying. Well, yeah, but th that's all part of the cultural development. So, yeah. I mean, clearly, since before the 1980s, but all the way through from the time of the passing of the referendum in 1983, uh, gradually, bit by bit, the political parties, to the extent that they were ever pro-life, became less so. Yes. Uh, the, the, the mainstream media in the, the Irish Times, the Irish Independent, or RTE, forming the triangular sort of axis, completely lost to us in terms of personnel and the way they presented to us. Yes. I used to make a joke in the 1990s when I was politically active. When they rang me up to come on a program, I would say, what indefensible position do you want me to defend tonight? <laughs> it was like, even the 1990s, it was that. You were being, you were, you were being brought on to defend something that they figured, oh, he can't defend that. Let's, well, let's, let's, let's just have him struggle. Yeah, well, it was the, it was the yeah. Aunt Sally. It was yeah. brought on so people yeah. could shout at me, yeah. and so on. So even at that stage, we had sort of lost it. Uh, to some extent, the, the invention of social media helped a bit, yeah. uh, but it didn't counterbalance. And so the, the, the cultural slide that we witnessed, uh, and which is probably unstoppable, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, simply carried us uh, to where we are today. It's interesting you say about social media because one of the outstanding things of the campaign was the fact that the repeal side blocked every single voice they could mm. on Twitter. Yep. They had an actual repeal shield, which they're still operating, <laughs> oh God, uh, yeah. lest they hear the arguments. Yeah, right. We are where we are. We are. You said not to panic. Yep. What do you think we should do? Well. First of all, I think we have to be brutally honest with ourselves and realize that there is no quick fix, Okay. right? Miracles do happen. You cannot plan your life on the basis of having a miracle happen. That's okay. why they're miracles. So, so that's why they're miracles. So we have to realize this is where we are, like it or not, and who likes it. Now you said to do what they did, infiltrate. Yep. Yep. How do we do that? Well, I mean, again, that's, that's a good yeah. question, as <laughs> any way possible. Right. Okay. I mean, by if you want to, if you, if joining a political party is your angle, do that. If yeah. writing for the papers or making a contact or going into journalism or whatever it might be, if becoming a teacher or becoming a university lecturer, if you think that helps, do any of those things. But overall, what we have to do is we have to win the culture back. Yes. If you think about it, see, laws by themselves don't protect you. No. In other words, that's been the great lesson. Uh, oh yeah, indeed. Un unless the laws are supported largely by the population as a whole, 
they're ineffective. Because they, they, they don't matter anymore. They don't matter. So what yeah. happened is we had the 1983 referendum, we had the law in the Constitution, we had the various bits and pieces of law that happened, of course, which chipped away it, but nonetheless it was still there. But in the meantime, it was like a house whose foundation had been started to hollow out. And okay. it kept hollowing out. And it kept out. hollowing out and eventually it just got the push and down it came. It didn't take only, it only took a little finger at that One point. One practical thing I would say, yes. to help, and I know we're going to have a practical discussion later on, I would say that one of the critical areas for Catholics and for Christians uh, in large is education. And that's our going to be a problem. Our schools are, no, I, I, I'm again, I'm, uh, this is not meant to be con condemnatory, our schools are a disaster. Our schools have effectively become um, simply institutions, state institutions for which the religious bodies provide free managerial services. We need to we need to either recapture those schools or abandon those schools or move over to homeschooling because it's the only way uh, in which we can, if you like, ensure that the remnant which we are will continue in our children and our grandchildren. Remember, I think, I mean, as I look at it, I cannot see a reversal of the situation or to anything like where we were in my lifetime. I do not expect to live to see it. So it's a long-term yeah. battle now. As you said, I they did 35 years. Yeah. We have to look at a similar 35 to 40 year battle. Yeah. So it'll uh, be our children. It will be, and it could even be our children's children. children. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, I again, for again, most people here, I think uh, many people are Christians, or even if not, if they're Jews, they understand uh, the story of the Exodus. Yes. From Egypt. And, and there, you, there, you have, there you have a model for what we need to do. When the Israelites left Egypt, why did it take them 40 years to get to Palestine? That always puzzled me as yeah. a child, because well, the distances did not seem to work. No, no, because you can get there in three weeks. Yes. <laughs> okay. It took, for a number of reasons, one, they couldn't go the, the land route, uh, sorry, the coast route because it was guarded, they couldn't go across the, nor the north of Sinai because there were posts and so on. So the genuine, uh, sort of the consensus is they had to go down the Sinai Peninsula and back around. But they didn't actually spend 40 years traveling. They spent about a year traveling and about 39 years at a place called Kadesh Barnea, which is just south of Palestine. And there, they had to toughen up. Okay, really, it wasn't until almost everybody who'd left Egypt had died, all of the people who were complaining from the moment they set out on the march. If you read the It was the so account, much easier back in Egypt, at least the Pharaoh fed us. Well, that's one of us that said, why did you take us from here to yeah. die in the desert? Right? So, so by the time they were in a position to cross the Jordan, right, they did it with people who had been born on the march and toughened in the desert. We have to take that as our model, right? The, the younger generation, who are the people who are going to carry the fight, yes. are, we are on the march, we are in the desert, we are living on manna, we are living on scraps, okay? Uh, Quail sometimes. <laughs> and so on, yeah. Uh, it, and um, we, there's not going to be any quick fix. We are not in a position to launch a counter movement yet, but we are in the position to start. And that means keeping control Keep of, some of, of some education. It means doing that, but it also means, and it's very important for those of us who are here, because it's so easy to get discouraged and demoralized. Oh, yes. We have to maintain our morale. We have to remember that, again, without condemning the people on the other side, again, we are, we are obliged to love our enemies, whoever they may be. Christianity and I do. is so awkward. I know, it, it, really, it really makes it hard, <laughs> okay? It's really tough, but remember, there, there are many people there who are genuinely, like, genuinely convinced that they are on the side of goodness and truth. Yes. There are some yeah. who are not, okay? But, yeah. but we cannot assume that they're all acting in bad yeah. faith. And therefore, we have to continue to appeal uh, to, to their good nature. We also have to realize, by the way, and this should be heartening, that the tide in some areas of the world is turning against abortion, right? We tend to be behind the curve. Here in Ireland. 20 years. Yeah, and yeah. I, no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting yeah. that, you know, again, it's going to be all rosy and so yeah. on, but, but things do happen elsewhere, and they do have an influence on us. We do. We, we, are, we are very influenced yes. by the world. We, we tend yeah. to look to other countries. Yeah. There's a number of issues that are still outstanding in, t in terms of politics. Yeah. We are where we are. Right now, the government has options. Mm. They have gone for the most extreme version of the legislation. Yeah that they could. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. However, there is, if you like, now in the margins and internationally, a discussion on the issue of born alive laws. What happens to a child who is born after an abortion? We've had a pediatrician, governor of Virginia, saying that they would be cared for to die. Um, 
we have no clear direction in this country. Mm. There are still medical ethics. Is there a need for born alive laws or should current legislation already cover a child that's there? Yeah, I don't really know what to say to yeah. that, Paddy. I mean, that's it's a, an awkward question, it's I know, but it's question. one of the areas... We, we shouldn't need yeah. them, right, obviously, clearly, uh, because whatever you, whatever you think about killing a child in the womb, and clearly the, 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 the longer a child develops in utero, more clearly it resembles you, meaning the less plausible any argument can be made that it isn't. Okay? But in a way, I mean, I made an argument in my book that if you take the abortion argument seriously, there's nothing magic about the transition from in utero to extra utero, from going from inside the mother's womb to outside. <laughs> and if you can legally kill a child in the womb, what's Singer's the position. doing it? Now, so there's, a, there's a philosopher in Princeton called Peter Singer who takes that position and said, yeah, absolutely, you're right, and therefore you should be able to kill a baby up to 18 months until their nerve cells are fully yeah. myelinated. I run the argument in the other yeah, direction. He is, he is at least consistent. He is consistent, yeah. yeah. Which <laughs> most, most of them aren't. They so seem to yeah. regard birth as a magic. Yeah, as a magic but thing. we yeah. seem now to have reached a point where <coughs> birth is no longer the magic. No, and that, that would worry me. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I, I'm, I'm afraid of making that point, actually, in case somebody thinks, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> it, it, the point is being made and mm. made quite seriously. Mm. We are where we are. The people in this room, as you say, may not see mm. that difference, but they have to fight on. Oh, yeah. You know, yes. How do we keep our spirits up? Well, by meetings like this, uh, by getting together occasionally, and by not despairing, and by trusting okay, that, that in the end, truth will out and goodness will prevail. Um, I sometimes console myself with the thought that it's not my job to save the world, which is just as well, because I'm not in a position to do it, right? nor is anybody else. The, the world has already been saved. Humankind has already been we saved. Are saved. So yeah. We have, we have oh, The only thing we have to do is to do our duty as well as we can in the positions to which we are called. Okay, if we have any energy beyond that, we should devote it. Okay, if we have resources, if we, have, if we can give money to causes, if we can give our time, uh, we can do it without expectation of anything magical happening in the short term. That's really, really important because if, you do, if you're expecting more or less instant results, I guarantee you, you're going to be disappointed. You see that as the enemy, I this expectation the enemy, yes, of the yes, instant result, yes, the inst yes, quick yes, fix. It's not going to happen. And that's going to lead people to despair. Yep, it is, I think so. And despair is always... A yeah, very it's bad deadly. thing. It's deadly. You are a musician. You've got enormous interest in music. I know one of the things that oddly kept coming up with people on the margins of, of meetings and things was the state of church music in <laughs> Ireland. Um, I am presuming that you have strong opinions. And I, I will put in there voluntarily that in my parish church uh, on the Feast of Christ the King, I think about three years ago, the recessional was David Bowie's Starman. I have to say we're considerably <laughs> luckier than that in my parish. <laughs> my, what do you think, is, is there room or areas for improvement that, that would be practical for parishes? Well, yes, but I mean, I think that's... You don't want to get well, into... Well, I'm just going to take my parish priest is here anyway, so I don't want to compromise And I'm sure that, he's so. a wonderful man. <laughs> he is, actually. Thank you, Father, for coming. We're but, uh, very glad to have no, you. But no, I mean, yes, there are certain things that can be yeah. done. I'm not a big fan of the mu music from the 1960s of onwards and so on, the Peter, yeah. Paul and Mary kind of stuff. It doesn't really impress me. Uh, I'm a Latin man myself. Okay. okay. I like it. I like plain yeah. chant. Um, and so on. Uh, I think it's music that's designed to be sung, where the words take precedence, which is and what the words do. are what's important. And the words are what's important. But yeah. anyway, we could go down that road, but let's not do that. It was just something I wanted I to know, throw yeah, at I you. Know at you're trying to get me into trouble here, Patty. Of course, <laughs> that's my job. You know, get somebody into trouble, and get someone as eminent, eminent as yourself into trouble. It's a real victory, Professor Jared Casey. Thank you so much for being with us thank you, and doing this interview. Not at all. Thank you.